Good evening. My name is Mike Fagelman, and I'm the Executive Director of Honest Reporting Canada. Today, it's my honor to welcome you to our Insider Briefing webinar, focused on what is arguably the biggest accusation leveled at Israel today by its detractors, allegations of war crimes. At the end of December, South Africa filed a case against Israel at the International Court of Justice in The Hague, accusing Israel of committing genocide in the Gaza Strip in its fight against Hamas. While the ICJ rejected South Africa's request to halt Israel's war against the terror group, that may be only the highest profile accusation, but it is far from the only one. Israel has been accused of ethnic cleansing, indiscriminate bombing, failing to distinguish between civilians and combatants, and war crimes writ large. But no matter how often these charges are leveled at Israel, that does not make the country guilty, even as Hamas cynically attempts to maximize Palestinian civilian casualties for PR purposes by deliberately embedding their terror infrastructure in civilian areas. Israel has un undertaken unprecedented steps to minimize innocent civilian casualties in Gaza. And now, I pass the discussion on to the chairman and co-founder of Honest Reporting Canada, Jonas Prince, who will be moderating our program this evening. Thank you. Thank you, Mike, and welcome to our dedicated Honest Reporting supporters. I assure you the next hour will be informative and revealing. More importantly, it will be crucial to your understanding of the media's portrayal of Israel's alleged war crimes. Our two international experts will unravel the misunderstandings as we navigate through this fog of war. Allow me to introduce them. First of all, Lieutenant General Aviv Kohavi was the IDF Chief of Staff from January 2019 to January 2023. On his watch, he dealt with COVID and he dealt with the Gaza War of 2021, Operation Guardian of the Wall. Previously, he served as commander of the Gaza Division, and that was during the disengagement in 2005, and also at the time of the Galad Shalit abduction in 2006. He also served as commander of the Northern Command. The general holds a BA of philosophy from Hebrew University, a master's in public administration from Harvard, a master's in international relations from John Hopkins. In short, he has had a very long and distinguished, outstanding military career for over 30 years. Our second expert guest today, and I welcome Natasha Hausdorf, is a UK-based barrister and an expert in international law. She holds a law degree from Oxford and a master's in public master's of law in public international law. Natasha clerked for the president of the Israeli Supreme Court. She is a frequent expert speaker at numerous international symposiums, as well as national broadcast networks like our friends at the CBC. She is a volunteer at the Director of UK Lawyers for Israel, an independent association of lawyers supporting Israel. Welcome to both of you and thank you for being here. Thank you. Allow me to introduce our topic today. Since October 7th, most journalists have bestowed upon themselves an honorary legal degree. They are speaking authoritatively on the topic of war crimes. While the laws themselves may not be unduly complex, they're complex, they're not unduly complex, the application of those laws to the current war in Gaza has been grossly distorted. The words of war crimes, genocide, proportionality, siege, humanitarian crisis, have been weaponized by the media as well as Israel's enemies. The Iron Dome defense against these verbal missiles is knowledge. I urge you to stay tuned for the next hour as we unravel these issues. General Natasha, I would like to frame our conversation into three broad categories, if you allow me. First of all, and we'll break these down, what is a legitimate basis to commence a war? Secondly, what are the rules that govern conduct during a war, the so-called international humanitarian law or laws of war? And thirdly, what is genocide? And we will discuss the recent ruling of the International Court of Justice. First of all, Natasha, it wouldn't be a proper legal conversation without some Latin phrases thrown around. 
What are the conditions under which states may resort to war, the so-called jus ad bellum? Well, uh, the relevant uh, situation here in terms of jus ad bellum, the conditions uh, under which states uh, may resort to war or armed conflict, um, really boils down to the concept of self-defence. Now, self-defence isn't a right bestowed upon any states uh, by international law. It's in fact considered to be an inherent right. Uh, arguably also, it's the first priority of any responsible government to keep its citizens safe. Uh, and the inherent right of self-defense is, for example, recognized in Article 51 of the UN Charter. Uh, it is considered so fundamental as being at the very heart of customary international law. Um, in the context, however, of what we saw on the 7th of October, uh, there are a, a few uh, competing analyses. Um, one would be that uh, as of the 6th of October, there was in fact a ceasefire between Israel and Hamas. Uh, and your audience, I'm sure, will be aware of previous rounds of conflict uh, at each point, unfortunately, started by Hamas. Uh, each of those ended in ceasefire. And so we see that state of armed conflict as being a prolonged one, uh, essentially, since shortly after the takeover uh, by Hamas of the Gaza Strip in a violent coup, where they threw their Fatah opposition members off the roofs of buildings. Um, since the first of these uh, military operations cast lead all the way back in 2008, 2009, uh, there has been uh, arguably a continuing armed conflict. Uh, and so we'd go all the way back uh, to that point as opposed to looking at the 7th of October specifically. But even starting the clock, of course, the 7th of October, Israel's right of self-defense uh, and it, the requirement that it resort to force uh, to remove the threat uh, that Hamas has posed uh, is a given. And the war aims, as stated by the war cabinet, defeating Hamas, ensuring that it can no longer present a threat to Israeli citizens uh, and re releasing the hostages uh, that were so brutally uh, abducted on the 7th of October. Those are, of course, all legitimate war aims in the context uh, of the start of this round of conflict. So... General, based on what Natasha has said, and I don't think anybody has doubted the denial, not anybody, but most people have not denied Israel's right of self-defense. You weren't chief of staff on October 7th, but you were several months before. What were the range of possible responses to that horrible attack on October 7th that the military would have considered? Well, um, first of all, thank you for having me. Uh, and with your permission, uh, I would like to add a new facts before answering your direct question. First of all, you know, four years ago, we have officially changed the name of Hamas, as well as Hezbollah, from terror organizations to terror militaries. Terror militaries. And why is that? Because we are not talking about an organization. This so-called organization is organized in companies, battalions, and brigades. It consists of tens of thousands of terrorists, and it holds state-of-the-art weapon systems. So the very notion, you know, of terror organization is wrong. We are dealing and we are confronting a terror military. Now, it has to do with proportionality, and it has to do with the operational plans that we had. And this goes back to your question. Not only this, Hamas has entrenched itself, embedded itself in or among population for 15 years. It makes it very challenging to cope with such an organization. And I'm laying out those facts because it, it has to do with your question. Now, in order to be effective vis-a-vis -vis this kind of organization, given the fact that it is embedded 
in highly densely populated areas, given the fact that it is spread out all over the Gaza Strip, and literally every other house is Hamas's asset, now you can understand why we had all sorts of operational plans. Most of them consist of many targets, targets that should be attacked uh, on the D-Day. And actually that's what happened or have been happening for the last more than three months, last three months. And of course, in addition, we have all sorts of operational ground maneuvers into the Gaza Strip in order to take over crucial uh, neighborhoods and crucial places and crucial cities, including high grounds, tunnels, and other uh, Hamas's uh, facilities. So we had a range of operational plans from, I would say, light and moderate response to very harsh, severe, and massive uh, response. And it was obvious that when the day comes, we will have to consider which one of those operational plans we have to carry out and to uh, execute. It, who makes, the war cabinet was not established on October 7th, of course. Uh, and I think it took a few days. Who makes the decision as to which of which type of response will be taken from a mild to a, a middle ground to a severe approach that was uh, a war based on air, land, sea, and underground? Is that a decision by the prime minister at that time, or is that the war cabinet decision once it's constituted? Well, usually it goes like this. I mean, the chief of staff uh, 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 comes with his recommendations to the minister of defense. And after agreeing on the right response and after agreeing on which kind of operational plan to carry out, usually they would go together to the prime minister. There will be kind of a small and camery uh, 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 discussion. And then it will be presented to the cabinet. And usually the cabinet approves what the Minister of Defense and the Prime Minister uh, have suggested. But you know, the, 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 the nitty gritty of the plan is of course in the hands of the Chief of Staff. Usually, usually he knows the work and he would recommend the right uh, respond and the magnitude of the respond and usually uh, it, it, it will be approved. I'd like to turn to the next sequence, which is the, that's the prelude, that's the justification for entering the war. Now I'd like to focus on the war itself. And Natasha, once again, I will ask you, um, once legal conditions to engage are met, which they have been, they are, I don't think anybody doubts that. And of course we need another Latin phrase to conduct, to govern the conduct of the war. Can you tell us what is use in bello? its components, but we'll go through the components individually. And um, what is the purpose? What is the purpose of the rules of law? It were originally set down to provide a, a framework for law abiding states uh, to regulate what is the most horrific set of circumstances that anyone can possibly imagine. Uh, war is brutal uh, and uh, horrific in, in the truest sense. Uh, but the idea of establishing a set of guiding principles by which lawful 
armed conflict could be conducted uh, was to minimize suffering in the first instance. Um, and it was essentially based, uh, the Geneva and uh, Hague regulations were based uh, for the most part on the assumption that uh, formal armies would be engaging each other. And so one of the key principles uh, under the laws of armed conflict, or often referred to as international humanitarian law, is the principle of distinction, which means that military personnel must distinguish themselves, I assume by wearing a uniform, uh, from non-combatants or civilians. And likewise, when conducting armed conflict, one must, uh, in terms of directing strikes, distinguish between lawful military targets, which would be military installations or military personnel combatants, uh, and those uh, that are civilians uh, or even protected, uh, have a protected status, which we can come on to into a little bit. Um, so one of the key principles of the laws of armed conflict is that principle of distinction, which was based upon the notion that uh, lawful armies would be fighting each other, not so unfortunately where one is contending with a terror military, as General Kohavi has uh, just described. Um, the two other key principles uh, that are worth bearing in mind in terms of the regulation of armed conflict uh, are the principle of military necessity. So action must only be taken which is necessary for achieving legitimate military objectives. And uh, those are, in the broadest sense, I set out in, in the previous answer in terms of Israel's war objectives here. Um, the uh, final of the three key principles is perhaps the most misrepresented, and that is the principle of proportionality. And so frequently, we will see this uh, touted in the media as being a, a casualty count on both sides. Now, that is uh, grotesque, um, not least because the corollary of that analysis is uh, often that not enough Jews have died to justify Israel's response. Uh, but it also, unfortunately, uh, would seek to, it seems, encourage uh, Hamas's tactics of hiding behind civilians and using civilians as human shields, driving up the civilians casualty count uh, as a means of putting pressure on Israel uh, to desist with its lawful military activities. Uh, and so it's very important to establish that proportionality uh, is certainly not totting up casualty figures on both sides and deciding uh, whether or not it's proportionate to continue armed conflict. Uh, proportionality is about the reasonable yeah. military commander making an assessment on a strike by strike basis uh, as to whether or not a the military advantage sought by a strike is proportionate to the anticipated collateral damage in a nutshell and it's important that the proportionality analysis is based on what is known to the commander ordering a strike. It is an intention-based analysis, not an effects-based analysis. Um, Israel's position is greatly enhanced by the intelligence that it has uh, of the situation on the ground in Gaza. And by all accounts, the proportionality assessments are therefore uh, even uh, better informed. And the role of lawyers in conducting uh, that proportionality analysis in, in the Israeli army and the IDF is also relatively unique because the Military Advocate General Corps, uh, the legal department of the IDF, it actually sits outside the chain of command. It is answerable to the Attorney General as opposed to the, the Chief of Staff so that Israel's military lawyers can uh, call off strikes and can uh, determine uh, where the proportionality analysis so uh, requires that a strike will not go ahead and, and deliver those uh, assessments to more senior officers. And, and that is critical. But the last principle that I would um, uh, highlight is, is an overarching principle, and that is called the principle of precaution. And that requires law abiding armies to take precaution uh, and to ensure that civilian casualties are kept to a minimum. Uh, and in a nutshell, Israel also surpasses the requirements of international law in that respect. It is unparalleled the measures that the IDF has taken uh, in terms of warning messages to individual householders by text message, phone call, dropping leaflets, providing safe passage for the civilians in Gaza through humanitarian corridors, defending those corridors and the civilians utilizing them despite Hamas uh, shooting and bombing civilians that are seeking to flee areas of intensive fighting following the suggestions uh, and instructions of the IDF. Uh, and also in terms of 
the precision weaponry that the IDF deploys um, and the uh, calling off of strikes uh, where that proportionality analysis may change or where uh, new factors come into the equation. Um, I'm sure our, our viewers have seen uh, a lot of the videos that are put out by Dovet Sal, the IDF spokesman, uh, of exactly those sorts of situations. Children wander onto the scene, uh, civilians are discovered that weren't seen there before, and strikes are called off accordingly. And that is a reflection of Israel upholding all of those key principles, distinction, proportionality, necessity, and precaution. Thank you, Natasha. I'd like to break those down because there's a lot in each one of those things. So I'd like to go back uh, and maybe in the order you discuss them with distinction, uh, which, as you say, is the obligation um, of combatants to distinguish themselves from civilians. Here we have the opposite. Uh, mm -hmm. on the Israeli side, and I and, and we you mentioned these rules of law were not intended in the Geneva Conventions to deal with these kind of asymmetric conflicts that we're having today. Correct. the The idea that you have a group, a terrorist organization, let's say that not only wears uniforms so they can be distinguished, but attempts to look like civilians so they can't be distinguished. And part of the problem, and I'd like to read you what um, um, a former U.S. Undersecretary of Defense said, Douglas Feith, which is a relatively new strategy. They've always used local population as shields. But he says, and I'll read this to you, of the Hudson Institute, Hamas has adopted a strategy of, quote, human sacrifice. The strategy, unquote, the strategy seeks to maximize civilian deaths on its own side, which he points out is unprecedented in the annals of war. The objective is to generate international pressure on Israel and to strengthen Israel's enemies and their depiction of the Jewish state as a villain, unquote. That's what he says. And I'd like to ask you, General, because we know this question, you have a Hamas fighter who has arms in every second house, as you say, and he runs, you see somebody running in, fires, runs out. What's left behind are a civilian who live in a civilian resident who lives in the house. What happens? We, it, it, how do you how do you instruct people, soldiers, what to do? How do you distinguish when when the whole objective is to undistinguish, to make it as impossible as it can be to distinguish? How do you survive in the army? What do you do? What do you instruct your soldiers? Yeah. Well, you know, the first thing that we train, and I would say educate, educate our soldiers and commanders is to do whatever they can, is to do their utmost in order not to harm non-combatants and not to harm civilians. I'm saying to educate because, you know, before talking about all sorts of procedures, before talking about all set of rules, before talking about international law, it's about our values. First and foremost, we are educating our commanders not to harm civilians or to do whatever they can in order to minimize the suffering of civilians. This is, to a large extent, much more important than any set of rules, any procedure, any legal advisors assisting us in the war rooms. Now, as to your question, it is a dilemma. And actually, you know, it's not only about talking about the principle of distinction, it's not only about the uniform. Think of it. They are using every civilian facility in order to perpetrate their deeds, in order to execute their terrorism. So it's not only about the uniform. We are not talking about, you know, the war in Afghanistan or in Falkland. They're in the wilderness of those islands. We are talking on highly densely populated area and not for nothing, actually, the Gaza Strip has become the most entrenched, complicated and complex array of terror organization or terror military in the world. 
in the history of warfare. The Gaza Strip is a product of 15 years of entrenchment, literally entrenchment, inside the ground, underground, and in every other building. Now, after mentioning the, 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 the education principle or the education element of our commanders, of course, we have a set of rules, we have a, 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 a procedures, we have special war rooms, we have special target committees. You know that in every war room, we have legal advisor. Every target we produce has, must undergo a special process before it becomes a legal target. And this is a very thorough process uh, made of many stages in each of which one person must approve the next stage. So one must understand every target that we are hitting, every bomb that we are dropping is only on military targets, short of the fact that we are doing whatever necessary in order to give the population the notice in advance, as Natasha mentioned, via leaflets, via SMS, via the radio, via representatives on the ground. So we are doing whatever we can in order to let them know in advance that we are about to strike this specific or designated neighborhood. And having said that, the war is full of dilemmas. The war is full with many moments where a certain where certain people must decide whether this target should be attacked or not. And I can tell you firsthand, firsthand, on many occasions, if we have a doubt, we don't strike this three-story house, one-story house, or 10-story house. And sometimes, sometimes we pay the toll for that. Sometimes after two minutes, we see the rocket get out from this building, uh, 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 firing at Zderot, Tel Aviv, or any other city. But there are many dilemmas, and usually the combination of procedures, rules, uh, educated and experienced commanders, they have to judge, they have to assess and to uh, make the decision on the spot whether this target is worth striking or not. It's very tough, it's complex, it necessitates a lot of experience, and that's what we are doing even after such a genocidal attack like the one that we have experienced uh, in October 7th. I'd like Don't to spend. Could I could I just echo that and add one additional layer, looking from the outside in, um, because it strikes me that the the education and the the purity of arms uh, that comes at the beginning of basic training is is critical to to what the general has been describing here, which is the approach of ordinary soldiers, which is well above the basic standards that international humanitarian law requires. But I think it's also indicative um, of a citizen army that the IDF is reflective of the values of Israel as a whole. And those values prize life above all else. And that one sees reflective, I think, across the ranks of the uh, Israeli Defense Forces. And I think that's probably also why one hears uh, Colonel Richard Kemp calling Israel the most moral army in the history of warfare, because it far surpasses the basic requirements of international humanitarian law that I set out. And that comes down to the individual soldiers themselves. You know, if I may, if I may, with your permission, when I was still the chief of staff, we run a three days operation against the Islamic Jihad in the Gaza Strip. Now, 
at the end of the operation, we finally had the opportunity to target and killing uh, the leader of the Southern Command of the Islamic Jihad. His name was Khaled Mansour. He was an arch terrorist, an arch terrorist who killed dozens of Israelis. Now, everything was in place. I mean, we knew about his location. It was in the heart of Khan Yunus, in the most densely populated area in the world, surrounded by many between three to four story houses. The planes were in the air. Everything was ready. I already green-lighted the operation. And then I was in the war room. And then we saw three kids, three kids playing adjacent to his target, adjacent to the target that was supposed to be attacked. I halted the attack. I halted the attack. Once again, this was an arch terrorist. Terrorist. I halted the attack and we waited 30 minutes, 60 minutes, two hours. And after two hours, I got a new piece of information. And that is that Khaled Mansour, this arch terrorist, was about to leave his hideout. And then we are going to miss the, the, the operation. I waited, I waited. And luckily after 30 minutes, after additional 30 minutes, those three kids, they left. Then I green lighted the operation, the, the, the strike. We attacked the target and we killed him. Once again, arch terrorist responsible for the death of dozens of Israelis. I'm not sure that any other military would have done the same. Now, it's not about me. It's not Aviv. I can tell you firsthand, many officers, maybe even right now, when I'm talking to you, many officers are experiencing the same thing every day, almost every hour. And this is the way they make their judgments. And that's why I mentioned the education and the roots and the heart of the way we are fighting terrorism and not only, you know, hiding behind the laws or the procedures or the rules of international law, which of course, needless to say, we are committed to and we are obliged to. Before we leave this topic, and that's a remarkable example, I do think it's important for our viewers to understand this this test. And we, we have a slide to the to the world. The media shows this as a sports score that that looks like there. It's a sports score. There's a there's a toll. It looks terrible. One thousand four hundred nineteen Israelis, twenty five thousand five hundred Palestinians. It 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 makes it look like a sports score a score. Or if you're an accountant, double entry bookkeeping. It's it has this misleading notion that too few Israelis are getting killed. And I'd just like to point out something that maybe is obvious, but all the laws recognize civilians will die in war. It, it goes without saying, and it's tragic, but the laws recognize that. And the balancing act, and that was a great example, And but the balancing act you go through, just again, it's is is judged at the time a decision is made. It's not judged on the casualties. It's judged on the mental state of the person making the decision, the frame of mind based on the information he knew or maybe should have known, and that's problematic with tunnels. But the test is, to repeat it, it's the anticipated anticipated military advantage of a strike can't be excessive in relation to the anticipated likely civilian collateral damage. That's what you're weighing. And I wouldn't know how to begin, but one thing we can look at are statistics, and it's always distasteful to say the well, least. Humans, 
I think it's important just in terms of that slide to pick up a few points, um, namely the the utterly uh, repugnant equivalence that is drawn with a comparison of those figures between Israeli casualties, according to I think it was Israeli authorities or or even the IDF, and uh, so, uh, supposedly twenty five thousand, according to the Hamas controlled Ministry of Health. I mean, this is a terrorist organization and the inflation of those numbers certainly cannot be surprising, even on the basis of individual incidents, like on the 17th of October, the supposed jump of 500 casualties as a result of what turned out to be the Palestinian Islamic Jihad rocket that fell in the al Akhli hospital car park. That figure was never revised, despite that incident being entirely uh, debunked and the reports discredited. Um, these uh, those figures from Hamas also don't distinguish critically between civilians and combatants, and neither do they indicate how Hamas say uh, these people were uh, said to be killed, um, whether they were shot by Hamas bombed by Hamas, as uh, reports of them bombing fleeing civilians uh, have been confirmed even by the Americans, uh, or indeed whether it is a result of Palestinian Islamic Jihad or Hamas rockets falling short in the Gaza Strip, which we know they do on a frequent basis. So those numbers uh, are untrustworthy, uh, do not show uh, the important aspects of those uh, answers to those questions. And nonetheless, they are being uh, reported, parroted by the media uh, without the proper qualifications. And, and that's uh, extremely problematic. But even even with all that, if I can do a simple calculation to illustrate this, you know this, I think it's important for our viewers to know this. If you take, and my, the numbers change daily, but if you said there were 25,000, I was saying 26, and I hate to round off with human lives, but of approximately nine to 10,000 were Hamas, you have a ratio of 15,000 civilians to 10,000 militants, which is, what's that, a three to two ratio? Um, in the Based United- the, Yeah, the latest figures is something like 1.8 uh, to one. So 1 1.8 civilians to every one combatant, which when one compares that with the global average put out by the United Nations in the context of urban warfare, nine to one, uh, or compare it with the American figures put out for Iraq and Afghanistan, which were three to one and five to one, respectively. Uh, I mean, the situation, despite every effort that Hamas has made, as you've quoted Doug Fife indicating, to increase civilian casualties uh, and inflate that toll, uh, the um, civilian to combatant ratio that uh, it appears even on those inflated figures Israel has been able to achieve is utterly unparalleled and testament to the sorts of uh, indications that the general was giving. So, uh, and, you know, with your permission, uh, we have taken, we Israel, we have taken steps and measures in order to protect mm -hmm. our citizens and that's why the numbers on our side is relatively low. I mean, we invested, we built, and it cost a fortune to build and to provide civilians with the Iron Dome. We uh, have built shelters for our civilians all over the place, and we have evacuated our citizens in order to protect them. Now, I do not expect Hamas to build their Iron Dome, but they could build shelters. Instead, they have been building their tunnels for their perpetrators, not for civilians. They could evacuate their citizens. Actually, we have encouraged them to evacuate neighborhoods and cities. So make no mistake, big part of those numbers or one of the main reasons for this asymmetry of numbers is because we are doing our utmost in order to protect our citizens. General, can you say something about the hostages? Yeah, well, first of all, this is our, this is a priority for us. Uh, we are committed and we are obliged and we must do whatever we can, of course, to bring them back. But 
For the sake of our discussion, I think that it is important to note that it's not only about part, I mean, the hostages is part of the ad bellum, but the hostages is also part of the in bellum. Put simply, the fact that Hamas holds more than 100 hostages in his hands provide us with the legitimacy to exert power and to use uh, all sorts of legal methods, but to exert power to the maximum degree possible. In other words, it's not only about the level of threat. When we are assessing the value of the targets, when we are assessing the tools and the methods that we are applying to the battle, the state of affairs, i.e. the hostages, should and must play a major role in our calculation. It doesn't mean that we have or we have the legitimacy to neglect international law. No, 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 I didn't say that. But it gives us the permission, and I would say it is imperative, imperative to exert power to the maximum possible level. Of course, in order to bring them back. Thank you. Natasha, do you want to say anything about hostages? Well, it certainly comes down to the military necessity uh, and the uh, framework that Israel is operating under. Um, when I set out earlier Israel's war aims, of course, the return of the hostages was key among them. Uh, and in that regard, that framework and those military objectives will inform the application of international law uh, and, and the way that Israel is conducting its operations. Um, in a broader context, of course, uh, and this is outside of uh, international humanitarian law specifically, but um, the responsibility uh, of countries that have leverage over Hamas, in particular Qatar, uh, to ensure that the hostages are returned immediately, um, that is a, an imperative. And I would hope that international organizations uh, and that uh, those other states with influence over Qatar would be utilizing that because um, it's clear it's clear that Qatar has uh, leverage and influence over Hamas, uh, and it's clear that they could be doing more. Uh, and it's a, a shameful day for the international community uh, that we are so far into this war uh, and that those hostages uh, are still uh, still being held in those awful, awful conditions. We need to get out of the topic of genocide. It's a critical topic. Just before we do, one of the imp and, uh, there are several impossible factors to this war, but I do need to spend a, a minute on tunnels because the, and there's nothing new about tunnels. Uh, tunnels uh, go back to biblical times. And for those out there that like a biblical reference, I have Exodus 22, one, where entering a house by a tunnel is something you can defend yourself and kill the perpetrator. So, uh, or check uh, Mishnah chapter eight in the Sanhedrin for those out there inclined to do that. But I, I have to say that the, the tunnels, uh, well, let me read you a quote from Daphne Richmond Barak, who wrote a book called Underground War Warfare. It's a, I call it a groundbreaking book, but that would be a bad play on words. Uh, she writes five years ago in a book called Underground Warfare, in legal terms, a tunnel's interconnected infrastructure impedes the assessment of proportionality, i.e. the determination of whether collateral damage resulting from the tunnel's destruction itself might be excessive in relation to the achieved perceived me uh, military advantage. And I know that, and the tunnels for those, Natasha's in London, and, and we know that this is 30%, there's more tunnel than there is in the underground in London. Um, so over a 15 or 20 year period, and it's been estimated a billion dollars has been spent, diverted by Hamas over a 20 year period. One can only imagine the deaths of the people who are constructing these, these tunnels that are very sophisticated structures. But you, the often ability- Often children. Often children, but the ability to, you have no visibility of what's going on and the entrances are hidden and they're hidden off in an urban. So the, the idea of, throw, after everything you've said, throwing this underground subterranean tunnel warfare into it, uh, it, it and again, is question I had on tunnels really uh, general is this, from a military point of view, they pose unique challenges. Did Israel underestimate the notion 
that the tunnels to some extent neutralize the proportionate might of the IDF and Hamas. Well, I, 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 it's it's hard to tell right now because we are in the midst of this war. But as far as I understand from commanders on the ground, uh, I would say that something between seventy to eighty percent of the tunnels and on the underground facilities, we did know about them. Uh, this is a major intelligence achievement, and uh, we have been developing all sorts of methods in order to cope with those tunnels. Uh, and as far as I understand, the military is quite successful in uh, blocking those tunnels and in neutralizing the tunnels, and in many cases, killing uh, uh, enemies, uh, uh, terrorists in those tunnels. Um, at the same time, at the same time, uh, it delays the rhythm of war, it delays the speed, it delays the ground maneuver, uh, but you know, it's, it's, it's part of the challenges uh, in the battlefield. I'd like to turn to genocide, and and um, of course, the I, we just had last Saturday International Holocaust Remembrance Day. Ironic, if it's uh, perhaps an irony, the day before is the date of the International Court of Justice decision. And genocide itself, as many of us know, is a term coined by the Jewish lawyer Raphael Lemkin in 1944 to describe the horrors of the Holocaust. Natasha, to start the conversation, before we talk about the court decision, please tell us what is the legal definition of genocide and how is it a part of international law? Well, reading from Article 2 of the Genocide Convention, it means any of the following acts committed with intent to destroy in whole or in part a national, ethnical, racial or religious group as such. And the acts that are listed include killing members of a group, causing serious bodily uh, or mental harm to members of the group, deliberately inflicting on the group conditions of life calculated to bring about its physical destruction in whole or in part and, and a few others. Uh, but the critical element of that definition is, of course, the intention which comes even before the actions themselves are listed, and that is uh, intention to destroy a group in whole or in part. That was what Raphael Lemkin was seeking to capture in terms of the definition of genocide in light of um, the intent to destroy the Jewish people. And as you say, uh, ironic, perhaps, uh, that it is being used now as a, as a, as a canard, as a blood libel uh, against the Jewish state, but even more grotesque as a result. Uh, I think it's extremely important to recognise that the reason South Africa has levelled uh, this particular allegation against Israel is, in fact, a technical one. It is a hook by which it has sought to bring this case to the International Court of Justice by virtue of the fact that Israel is a party to the Genocide Convention, which I just read the definition from Article 2 uh, from. Uh, and it has accepted the jurisdiction of the court uh, by virtue of Article 9 of the Convention. And as a result, it has participated in this farce in the hearings uh, that we saw uh, earlier this month uh, and in uh, representing uh, its case and seeking to uh, put the lie to the allegations that South Africa have leveled. In the context of the case set out by the South African legal team, however, we saw uh, a whole plethora of uh, allegations, uh, including war crimes, including apartheid, which have uh, no relevance to the actual claim of apartheid that they have advanced, uh, and also uh, seeking to misrepresent many statements of Israeli officials uh, in making out uh, a supposed intention to commit genocide, to uh, eradicate a group in whole or in part. Uh, and that is 
important to appreciate uh, the misrepresentations that South Africa has have advanced uh, have unfortunately I believe already done a world of harm and the fact that this term is now being deployed with such frequency especially in the media against Israel uh, means that South Africa has essentially succeeded in its attempt uh, to shift the narrative to put forward pseudo legal terminology uh, and to advance this blood libel against Israel. Well, let's let's go back a little bit. We the key element is intent. Yes. Um, has the other the, the two elements of the intent and the outcome <clears throat> and the court in its decision said there were there have been and there are members of the group, which is the Palestinian people. So when reading a definition, we can be specific. There has been bodily harm. There's been immense, we see it 24-7, the undoubted destruction of property, undoubted suffering, uh, undoubted hardship. So that aspect is there. If there were no intent, presumably then there's no genocide. It comes down, as you say, to intent. And the question, uh, and let, let me ask, well, if I can also just clarify, though, that the acts themselves, and this is a, a, a big misconception which is being promoted in terms of analysis of the court's order, uh, the, the court didn't in fact go that far. Um, and it didn't make any substantive findings in this case. Uh, it has used a test of plausibility, but it has used that test at this very early stage only on the claims that South Africa brings. And it has been very clear, paragraph 54 of the order, that it is considered whether the claims that South Africa brings fall under the convention itself. I can't think of a lower threshold uh, to which to apply this uh, concept of plausibility. Uh, but it is critical that the, the that this misrepresentation is called out. The court has not made any assessment of whether there is a breach of the convention or whether it is plausible that Israel has breached the convention. The only assessment is whether the claims that South Africa have brought are plausible, whether they fall under the provisions of the convention itself. Uh, and in that respect, uh, so much of, of what is being reported about the, the order of last Friday uh, and the provisional measures that have been made uh, is, is simply incorrect. Well, let's let's take a look. The, the panel uh, of which Aaron Barak, a former uh, Chief Justice of the Israeli Supreme Court, no friend of the current government, I'm guessing, um, and uh, the judge from Uganda who dissented on all the findings, Barack actually agreed uh, in the case of preserving evidence. But I want, I want to come back to the court finding what the court looked at because it has been misfun. And one thing is the jurisdiction of the court. And again, I think it's not obvious that the court is not making finding on those any of those three items we talked about, war crimes of distinction, proportionality, and military necessity. It's it's a different set of rules, and it can only rule with respect to genocide. And mm -hmm. the interesting thing is, South Africa and Israel are the parties. Hamas is not a party to the proceeding. So when the court makes an order, they can't order Hamas to do anything. And of course, had they ordered a ceasefire, it's a one-sided ceasefire. So they don't order a ceasefire, they just tell Israel to stop fighting and open up its doors to a slaughter. Why is it, it's not obvious, I think, to many people, why isn't Hamas there as a party? What is South Africa doing there as the champion of Palestinian rights? There, there has been some writing about, and well, we have a photograph. South Africa has entertained Hamas leaders in the past. It has a relationship with Hamas. Yes, here. and on that basis, I would I would challenge South Africa appearing there as a champion of Palestinian rights. South Africa is a champion of Hamas, an internationally prescribed terrorist organization. No individual who cares about Palestinian rights would be seeking to prop up Hamas, uh, given that the Palestinian people have borne the brunt of their brutality uh, and their corruption and their slaughter and, and the torture uh, over the last uh, 16, 17 years. It's clear from Hamas having celebrated the outcome uh, and thanked South Africa for their good work uh, that South Africa here is doing the bidding of an internationally prescribed terrorist organization. Well, we've just had a photo put up, I'd put it back, of a victory hug. Uh, yes. President, you have that, of South Africa. 
Rahamosa on the left and the deputy ambassador Bassam al Husseini on the right. And uh, we know that, as I said, South Africa has been entertaining Hamas and they are, I think uh, one of the Israeli lawyers said they are the legal counsel for Hamas in effect. So important to understand that this ruling has no impact on Hamas. It has mm. been decided. The ruling has been criticized uh, on many fronts. But I, I want to talk about the question of intention because there had to be presumptive or prima facie um, evidence of intention and that the court had to find. And Aaron Barak, in his reasons for his decision, points out that in terms of plausibility on intention, the court had to say something, they had to find something. And they found figures for the, in, the, in the death count itself, which they point he points out was very different from a prior precedent case in Gambia. But for the sake of today, we've already established the numbers themselves aren't evidence of anything, let alone intention. And then he looks to statements made by members of who and our friends UNRWA, <clears throat> our good friends, some statements they made, but even the statements he quotes, according to Barack, <clears throat> did not deal with intention. They were simply statements. And then he quotes three Israeli officials and makes the point that either the official had no standing, he was an official of the government, but had no standing to influence anything, or they were taken out of context. And the most extreme example is the quote from the Bible of Amalek, uh, and we won't get into today, it's not our topic, who is Amalek and who were they and what do we know about them? However, clearly the reference is to Hamas in the in the immediate aftermath of the slaughter on October 7th. So points out that it's quite a stretch. And this is why the Ugandan judge uh, dissents. If you were hired to argue the case for South Africa, where do you see intent? Where is there plausible intent? There is none. And it's important to be clear that the court... Uh, didn't uh, consider uh, intent because it didn't consider breaches uh, of the genocide convention. It was very clear in adopting the previous case law um, and uh, I would perhaps even argue developing it in terms of the, the reduction further still of the threshold of plausibility. Uh, but it, a following suit of uh, Ukraine-Russia uh, and of um, the Myanmar case, uh, it assessed the plausibility of the rights under the convention and the claims that South Africa was advancing. Uh, and in that respect, it, it was almost tautologous, um, or it was tautologous. Uh, it found that the claims that South Africa was advancing under the convention uh, were plausibly claims under the convention. That is as far as the court's reasoning went. And the fact that the provisional measures that the court adopted uh, essentially restate Israel's obligations under international law, under the Genocide Convention. There's no substantive advancement apart from the requirement that Israel provide a report uh, on what it is doing to the court. Yes, the fact that the provisional measures uh, are, as the South African judge uh, termed them, redundant, I think underscore the fact uh, that this was a complete non-event. Uh, there was nothing uh, substantive found and nothing substantive um, uh, required or ordered as part of the provisional measures because there is no I evidence that Israel is uh, engaged in genocide, quite the contrary. And I'd like to go through very quickly what these provisional measures are as we wound down. And I do want to call out the name of the judge. She got that not let her just be called the judge. She is Julia Sepputendi because her name needs to be known. She's a friend of Israel. Uh, uh, and maybe uh, I'm not so uh, sure that she's taken the position as a friend of Israel. I think she's very clearly and cogently set out the law and applied it to uh, the facts. Uh, and in that respect, uh, she has done what I would have hoped that all the judges of the International Court of Justice would likewise have engaged in. Better said, she's my friend, though. Uh, let's say yeah, the. But you know, if I may, if mm -hmm. I may, a quick, a quick note. I truly do not understand this whole discussion about declarations, quotations from senior leadership in Israel. I mean, what matters is the deeds, the actions on the ground, and judging by the actions on the ground, here is what we are doing on a daily basis. First, we give each and every time an early warning to the population. Second, we have provided, we set up corridors 
for this po uh, population to move from one place to another in order to be protected. Thirdly, we have secured those corridors in order to prevent Hamas to stop the migration of those people. And lastly, as I mentioned, we are selecting the targets in a very thorough and professional manners, and we are striking only military targets. So what is all this discussion about, you know, quotations and declarations? What matters most is the actions on the ground, and the actions on the ground speaks volume. And Period. in addition to that, the uh, efforts of COGAT, which is the unit of the IDF devoted to humanitarian assistance of civilians in armed conflict, uh, has consistently provided um, exactly that, aid to the civilians of Gaza, uh, and has coordinated uh, international relief efforts. Uh, and that was a substantial part of the evidence that was provided by the Israeli legal team, none of which uh, has appeared in the order uh, on Friday, unfortunately. None of that information. The order, to be clear, says five things. It's, and just to paraphrase it in a very quick way, what I'll say is Israel has to take all measures to prevent genocide, punish and direct public incitement to commit genocide, provide the provision of basic services, ensure preservation of evidence in that, to the extent Israel has it, and fifthly, submit a report. Now, you've said, Natasha, I think that the first four things are things that are happening anyway, and that's what the judge had said. Just not just restating what the obligations are anyway. This fifth obligation to file a report, my question is, what happens, A, if a report is not filed, and B, if a report is filed, and the court in South Africa has a review, can this court come back in 30 days or 30 days plus the time it takes to review and say, oh, we've added a few things We've taken away a few things. Can they amend these provisions? Or what happens with the report? So Israel is a country of law and order. It has engaged with this process thus far. I think every indication is it will simply provide the report and further evidence uh, of all the measures that it is taking to, in an unprecedented fashion, uh, ensure that the uh, needs of the civilian population are met, uh, even where Hamas steals and diverts aid shipments and sells off the surplus at uh, highly inflated prices. Um, but uh, aside from the report itself being forthcoming, I, I think uh, we should be prepared to see the circus continue. Uh, I wouldn't put it past South Africa uh, to seek to challenge whether or not Israel is in fact complying uh, with its international law obligations because it is simply restating uh, the misinformation that it brought to the court in the first instance. Some of that indeed uh, is with the complete misrepresentation of some of the statements uh, that the general has referenced, uh, absent the context where it is clear that uh, members of the war cabinet were referring to Hamas uh, and not the Palestinian people. Um, so I wouldn't put it past South Africa to continue harassing Israel through the International Court of Justice. And I think it's extremely problematic, not just for Israel, but for all law-abiding states, for those that uh, uphold and prize the rule of law, that the International Court of Justice would be entertaining this, would be essentially doing the bidding of a terrorist organization. Uh, and in that regard, it's very telling that Iran rejoined the compulsory jurisdiction of the court last spring. Uh, there are and there have been for some time uh, significant indicators uh, that uh, the UN's court uh, has been uh, prepared to go down the route that many other UN institutions uh, have already unfortunately been dragged down, that of lawfare, of law being used for political purposes, in particular to target Israel. Uh, we've seen in the last few days the scandal erupting over UNRWA. None of that information is particularly new, uh, but at least now that the international community is taking a greater heed uh, of the scandalous connections of the UNRWA organization with the Hamas and Palestinian Islamic Jihad organizations, their long history of indoctrination. I mean, all of this feeds into the UN system of which the International Court of Justice sits uh, at the top of uh, and how um, it is being deployed against Israel uh, for these purposes of lawfare. Thank you. Uh, I, I would 
unfortunately, uh, we could go, we've run the, an hour's flown by. Uh, we could probably do a weekly series for Netflix on uh, the problems in the Middle East and the war, and I'm sure um, shed light. But if I can just summarize what I think or at my own observation is, is this since October 7th, the Israeli response to the unspeakable events uh, of that day, the IDF may be facing the most complex and difficult circumstances in military history fighting this asymmetric war with a small, dense population controlled by non-state terrorists, using the local population as human shields and their infrastructure with over 600 kilometers of underground tunnels embedded in a world of social media and at a time where international anti-Semitism has exploded. With that, you're performing a remarkable task. So thank you, Natasha. Thank you, General, for your time today. Uh, General, thank you for your service to Israel over a long period of time. We look, you're a young man. We look forward to seeing what you'll do next, and I'm sure it'll be in the interest of your country. Natasha, thank you for your tireless defense of Israel. Thank you to our supporters. I would like to finally conclude, if you allow me, on a personal note, and I know our viewers will allow me because they're on mute. Um, we just observed International Holocaust Remembrance Day. I speak I personally speak as a refugee to Canada. Most of my family perished in the Holocaust. And I will echo the chorus of people who are saying never again is now. Am Yisroel Chai. Thank you very much. Thank you very much.